thanks for taking the time to be here with us today. Um, you see the title of this great debate, which is on science neocolonialism. Very briefly, this is science neocolonialism or helicopter science in a nutshell. It's uh, basically going to other country, taking samples, collecting data, and then going back to own laboratories without involving local researchers. An outline of our great debate this morning. I will give a very brief introduction. My name is Giuliana Panieri, and I'm convening this uh, great debate together with my colleague, Robin Pickering. Uh, we will um, explain you what have been the actions that AGU has taken. Uh, we will introduce our panelists. We have prepared five questions that uh, uh, we will pose to our panelists and also to the audience, you in the room, but also our members, which are following the great debate online. At the end, we really hope that we can all engage in an open discussion because we need suggestion for future actions that EGU can take. As you know, EGU is a bottom-up organization. So what we think, what we suggest is relevant. And uh, what we suggest is for the benefit of us and the union overall. Uh, I kindly remind uh, everyone that uh, EGU has a code of conduct and uh, we would like to have this discussion um, nice and respectful for everyone, which doesn't mean that uh, we can disagree, but uh, we try to be kind with each other. Um, very briefly, what have been the actions that EGU has taken? For those of you that has followed us last year, for the first time uh, in the union, we have organized a union symposium on this topic, science neocolonialism. And the reason for that is because we realized that we have to educate ourselves. This was a topic that was not really um, I would say taken into consideration. So we started last year to educate, to raise awareness in the union on this topic. After that, um, we have organized this year a short course that has been uh, very well attended by all the members. We are having this great debate today with these uh, marvelous panelists. Um, we have been asked last year to write uh, a common piece in a nature geoscience, which is in press. And then uh, uh, EGU has released a statement on inclusion in global research in celebration of Earth Day. And we have the uh, vice president of EGU. She was president when this uh, statement was released and she can briefly update us about, about it. And then uh, um, an action which, is, uh, which need to be implemented but has started already. The Publication Committee Working Group is going to include an author acknowledgement to accompany relevant new publication. But there will be more actions, there will be more activities, and for those, we also need you. Without any further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce, or I will ask, kindly ask the panelists to introduce briefly themselves, Nook. Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm Anouk Benist. I'm an assistant professor at the Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam. I'm also a geologist, and it means I travel a lot. Um, I'm also still an early career scientist, which means that I'm building my career and trying to figure out how to best conduct my science. And that includes working with my international collaborators. Um, a few years ago, I, got an, I learned about the concept of scientific new colonialism, and I was evaluating the way I was doing science. And I realized that the practices weren't always very inclusive and very fair. Um, so I started to read about it and talking to people about it. And I guess that led to uh, the collaboration that we have here on the table today. And um, 
yeah, I'm very excited to sit here to talk to you today, and I look forward to the discussion that we are having. Thanks, Anouk. Uh, Wendy? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Wendy Kumalo, and I'm uh, also an early career um, scientist. Um, I did my undergraduate and master's at the University of Cape Town in South Africa as a geology student. Uh, and the time in which I started studying was 2015. And that was around the time of uh, a lot of student protests about removing the statue of Cecil John Rhodes uh, from our university campus. And so my whole sort of university career, it's been constant sort of conversations about neocolonialism, what decolonizing the university space looks like. Um, and then recently I've moved to Norway to do my PhD. And so, yeah, that's me. Team Rowling. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tim Rowling. I'm um, the director of OSCOPE, which is a research infrastructure provider in Australia. I'm uh, a cis white male, and I have um, benefited from you know enormous privilege during my career. Uh, but I don't think I realised that until relatively recently, and I think that's one of the challenges um, that we need to address. I also consider myself to be socially and politically progressive. Um, and whenever I've entered into relationships when doing research in Southwest Pacific and New Caledonia, uh, in Australia, I always think I went in uh, very well-meaning and intending to do the right thing. And looking back, I realized that I made many mistakes, uh, largely because I was so uninformed. And I think that that's the reason that I've tried to become involved recently in establishing things like JICE, which is the Geoscience Indigenous Collaboration and Engagement uh, Specialist Group in Australia, uh, and why I was very delighted to be able to be part of this panel today. Thank you. Rebecca. Yeah, hello everyone. My name is Rebecca Haka. I am a director at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in the US, so thank you for, for inviting me. And by training, I'm a geographer and also a cultural anthropologist. And for the last about 15, 20 years, uh, I've tried in everything I do to make science more accessible, more inclusive, and more equitable. And when I started my career, I was thinking a lot about community engagement and was looking at projects and often the projects had the community engagement part at the very end, right? So we did science, we had great findings. And then if we thought we did well, we reached out to communities at the very end of that process and shared our great wisdom, right? And so we already thought that that was progress. And I think thankfully, a lot of things have changed since then. And I'm seeing conversations like these, and I'm seeing the leadership of the EGU to really pushing what do we need to do to flip this paradigm on its head and um, trying to start the process with community engagement and really respecting all knowledges before we even start the research. And I think that is really key. Um, in the US, uh, I am part of a project that I'm incredibly excited about, if you like to look it up. It's called Rising Voices, Changing Coastlines. And it is a large National Science Foundation funded effort that is not led by a large research institute, but by Haskell Indian Nations University. So the indigenous scholars are leading the effort in four hubs around the country to understand climate change impacts on coastal regions and trying to find indigenous solutions to it. And us in a big research institute are only invited into the space as needed for our tools and resources. So it's a complete flip of how we usually approach uh, geoscience. And it's one example that I think we can learn a lot from. So thank you for having me. Ellen Glaze. Now, thank you, Juliana, and, and I find it really interesting to listen to the different perspectives of, of everybody sitting here on the on the panel. Um, so I'm Helen Glaves. I'm actually based at the British Geological Survey in the UK, which is uh, one of the oldest geological surveys in the world. And as you might imagine, being British, we have quite a, 
a, a checkered history where this uh, this topic is concerned. Um, but I, I'm actually um, sitting here today, I think, as um, a representative of EGU's leadership. Um, as Juliana mentioned in her introduction, I, I was actually president of the union for two years up until Monday. Um, so I will continue in the leadership for another year. And when I became EGU president, part of my priority for standing to be elected was around equality, diversity and inclusivity. And you know, really thinking about what is the role of EGU in promoting those values. And I, I'm actually really proud that neo-colonialism is one of those topics that we are now seeking to, to spearhead. And we're actually trying to drive those conversations. And I think EGU is recognized by our sibling societies as leading the way and starting and taking forward these conversations. But I think I also wanted to comment on what is the role of a scientific society in these conversations. And I think it's about empowering our members to actually make sure they feel that they can raise these issues with their own institutions. But more than that, we need to raise awareness. I was quite interested very recently because I wear a number of hats across a number of things because although I'm a geologist, I, I now work more in the informatics and science for policy space. And one of my colleagues at my home institution quite recently said to me, until you, I gave a lunchtime lecture at my office and um, on this topic, and they said, um, I had no idea. I, I, it, this had never crossed my mind. And yet they've been working in Africa for decades. And I think this demonstrates that actually one of the key roles of scientific society is raising awareness, which is why I think sessions like this and the fantastic short course we had earlier this week are really important. And it's fantastic to see so many of our members really engaging in this conversation. But I think the other thing, and again, Juliana, you alluded to this in your introduction, there, there actually needs to be more than just talking about it. So EGU is actually very committed to taking concrete actions to really engender ethical research practices among our members, but also within EGU's act own activities, such as articles and journal publications that are submitted to EGU journals, fulfill a certain number of requirements with regards to acknowledging where um, data and uh, research has been conducted in other countries to ensure that there has been appropriate engagement with local researchers, but more than that, also making sure that we're truly inclusive in our research practices above and beyond where appropriate. But I have to say, Rebecca, I'm really excited about this project you just mentioned, where actually the research is being conducted by local researchers and they're calling on experts. I like this idea of flipping the whole model on its head. So I'm hoping we're going to hear a bit more about that today as well. So, but I, I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Juliana. Thanks a lot, Ellen. Thanks, everyone. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the conveners, there was no space for everyone on this table, but uh, we have other conveners of this uh, debate, which are Lisa Wingate and Barbara Ervens. With them, we have prepared the uh, questions for this uh, debate, and uh, I think we can start now. Robin. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, thank you very much for being here today. So at this stage, we're gonna move on to these five questions. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to pose these questions to the panel and get their responses. And then rather than waiting till the very end of the debate to get audience response, we're going to immediately flip this to the audience. So here's the first question. Think about it. Think, formulate some responses. Um, but to keep to time, we do have to have a timer on how long we can discuss each one of these questions. And there will be an opportunity at the end of the debate to have um, an open audience response and discussion. So please um, bring your responses to these. So our first question is, why is it vital that local communities participate in geoscience research? And so I'm gonna pass this over to for a first response from the panel to Wendy, please. Um, hi again. Um, so for me, an important question to kind of 
think about with this question is who does the science belong to and outside of things like IP regulations and um, rights, uh, I think it's important to, if we're thinking of going into spaces and doing science, asking ourselves who's entitled to information about those kind of spaces and naturally it should be the local community and I guess also extending to local researchers. Um, and I think even if you know the research doesn't have a direct impact on people's day-to-day -day lives, it's still important that that information isn't just taken out of a place and disseminated in places which are at best exclusionary of um, the community, but at worst also strip away agency and are very harmful to the community. So I think in this way, having sort of local communities and local researchers included is one mutually beneficial, but also doesn't have to be mutually beneficial, right? It can just be done because it's the right thing. Thank you, Wendy. I'm gonna follow up and ask you another part of this question, which is the local communities, but there's also the local researchers. I think we need to be clear that there's local communities, as in people who have the privilege to live in places where other people want to do fieldwork, but there's also local geoscience and um, geoscientists and local research communities. So, can you do? You, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I think it's um, in terms of getting local scientists. I think offers obviously a completely different perspective that a lot of the time can be overlooked from someone coming from outside of the space. And I think on top of that, having local scientists helps bridge the gap between how actually you can begin to interact with local communities. And I think it's something that should be led by local researchers because you can't have, for example, me going and telling you how to interact with a community that is not my own. Um, I wouldn't have the I wouldn't be privy to a lot of the knowledge and the way local things are done. So, uh, yeah, that's all. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to pose the same question to Tim. Tim, can you give us your response, please? Yeah, thanks, Robert. And maybe I'll um, respond to that second part first. I think that there's a risk, there's a challenge in, in finding often when you go into a, a foreign place, whether it be within your own country or elsewhere, it's, it's often really hard to find the connection into the community that you want to engage with. And I think that there's a risk that when we do go into other countries, for example, as colonial scientists, then it's easy for us to think we're engaging because we're engaging with other colonial scientists within those countries. So, you know, when I worked in New Caledonia, I went straight to the BRGM and, and connected with them, but I wasn't really connecting with local scientists at all. So I think it's, it's important to make sure that we take the next step and find those really local communities. I guess the other point I'd make is that, um, you know, communities that have, communities, uh, indigenous communities particularly often have a very different relationship with country. So in Australia, um, the indigenous people uh, were our first geoscientists. You know, they've been observing change in the environment for 60,000 years and their stories tell of meteorite impacts and tsunamis and they tell of, uh, you know, inundation of the east coast of Australia post the last glacial. They've been telling these stories and it's part of their dream time. It's part of their, their makeup and their relationship to the land is so different to ours because we come in as settlers and see it as a commodity and see it as something that we can extract resources from and something we can own. And so we have this huge um, baggage around it that, that's very hard for, for a well-meaning geoscientist going out there to try to do their bit of research now to overcome, particularly in Australia where you know mining has done so much damage, even very recently with Rio Tinto blasting sacred sites in Jukun Gorge in 2020 in Western Australia. So there's a living history that we have to overcome and that's very, very difficult. Um, and I think the challenge for us is that we don't understand often that those indigenous communities have such a different relationship to country, where country is part of the sense of self for that community and it's part of their identity. And they have a, a sort of a care and responsibility relationship with that land rather than a, an ownership and 
and resource potential relationships. So for us as a colonial researcher stepping into that space, we actually, you know, we, we think of sort of, we look for a Venn diagram of where do, our, where do our worlds overlap? And in reality, you know, they're like this and we have to step right out of our world and into, into that world if we're going to do anything meaningful. And I think that's really uncomfortable for us and really challenging. And often we don't know how to do it. So I think that's, that's the thing we need to address. Thank you, Tim. And I think this topic of the need to build trust between um, geoscientists and academia and local communities is behind a lot of this. Um, and it is something which, as the conveners, we are aware that's not well re represented on the panel is actual Indigenous communities. Um, and I'd, I'd like to briefly hand back to Juliana to comment on this, because there is actually a backstory to this. Yeah, we when we started to, uh, well, everything started from last year, when we started to think which might be the actions that we could take or real uh, um, concrete actions. So we discussed about having a great debate and we wanted to have uh, indigenous and local community speaking and also scientists speaking, local scientists speaking in this uh, uh, debate. And uh, we tried quite hard for a couple of months <laughs> to reach uh, different uh, uh, organization, starting from the top, so leadership, down to uh, researchers, so indigenous researchers, but uh, we have received uh, many no's, and that's why we don't have them here today. And we, of course, uh, were quite uh, um, sad, but we didn't really understand why they refused this invitation. Uh, and then we said, okay, maybe we should have started earlier. We could have explained better ourselves what we wanted to do. And um, and actually it was thanking to our panelists because we posed these questions also to them. And it was Rebecca actually that helped us in uh, uh, maybe finding an answer uh, to the fact that uh, until now we have received the no, but maybe in the future it will be different. Um, I think that Robin mentioned a, a key word here, which is building trust. This is what on this is a topic. No, it's not a topic, but this is something on which we have to work. And uh, we, thanks to Rebecca, we thought, okay, maybe we need to educate ourselves first because there are plenty of resources everywhere. So it's better to start with that, and then when we are ready, when we know more, then maybe we we get the trust from uh, uh, our colleagues, right, Rebecca? And uh, is there someone from the audience or from uh, our members online that would like to share some ideas or comments on this? Have you had some experience in, in trying to engage with the uh, uh, local communities or local geoscientists or scientists and you have received a no. Yes, please. If you can say your name, that would be really nice. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the, the organization of this debate. I'm Tanguy Jonville uh, from the CNRS. Uh, it's more of a question and of a comment. Uh, when you try to reach uh, local researchers, have you tried to reach them only on the topic of neocolonialism or also on their research, because that might be part of the answer here. And I also wonder uh, whether there has been some like specific plan for them to pay the fee that is still quite high, maybe for some local community representatives. Thanks. Um, I think you know the question about the um, barriers to participation. Like this isn't an expensive meeting. So the invited panelists get a, um, a registration waiver and accommodation and transport support from EGU, which is generous. So, and we did include this in the invitation. Um, and we were, to be clear, we were just in, we were inviting organizations to speak um, at the event. Um, but what, what, what we would really be very interested if anyone in the audience has a response to this um, question.
well, you have not tried yet, so <laughs> maybe you should try more to, yeah. Yes, please just go up to the yeah. microphone. And if you can please tell us your name, um, your institution. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Daniel. I come from Ecuador um, and I'm a volcanologist. I have been working with Euro European and well, global north researchers for a long time in Ecuador. And um, my view about this question is, um, um, it, is it, but why, why is it vital for, for who? I, I would say who, who is it vital for that communities participate? Is it vital for research or for researchers or for themselves? And this is something important to understand first. And then um, I would say if that is it vital for local communities, um, I think that um, something uh, useful would is that we first go and ask them if it is, is if this research would be vital for them or not. Once we ask, we can start to invite them to participate and be part of this uh, research if they want. <laughs> Maybe they don't care. They don't. They are not interested in in our research. Most of the time they will be, but if they are not, it's okay. We, we just need to start with a conversation with them and asking them what, how they feel about what we would like to do in, in their spaces. Um, and once, um, let's say, um, we explain what we, what we would like to do, invite them to participate, and then they decide that um, they are not interested and they are not willing to let us go in their um, spaces to do our research, our research um, uh, is then when things may become complicated because um, we would probably start um, uh, willing to negotiate because we want to go any way with what we would like to do as, as a research project, for example. And in these negotiations um, or this negative answer from them uh, may be an invitation to start negotiations that may involve in the future uh, other ethic problems that may arise from that. So this is, it is vital, I think, for several, for everybody involved in, in the research and it needs a complex um, approach to, to, um, uh, for this invitation, and then it may give place to more complex ethical situation. Thanks a lot for your contribution. I think we have another question or a comment, but then we have to move to the next and we can keep some discussion at the, at the end, but uh, please. Hi, I'm Andrea Walter. I'm a Canadian European researcher who recently moved to New Zealand, Aotearoa, um, and have been working quite closely with Maori iwi or tribes. Um, and so their short answer to why, you know, the, the no question is capacity. They just do not have the capacity to engage with scientists who, as the previous commenter said, may not even be serving their needs. Um, in my experience, they're also more interested in long-term engagement, whereas science has been typically very short-sighted and short-term, particularly with funding. Um, and I would also um, second that part of the, um, perhaps you could call them empathy interviews to really tr truly understand local communities' needs um, and how the science can help rather than coming in and saying, this is what we want to do. Um, so again, that capacity issue is really important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid I'm, I'm running a time and I did warn you, we were gonna have brief discussions about each of these questions, but please hold your responses. Um, and there is definitely time at the end to discuss more. I want to move on to our second question.
which is which are the barriers preventing inclusion of local communities within the geoscience research ecosystem. So I think we've just touched on these interest, capacity, inclusion. But um, to discuss this more widely, I'd like to pass this over to um, our panelist, Rebecca. So can you give us your response to this, please? Yeah, I think we already had, uh, as you say, a really good point um, here. And I think there's there's so many issues that come to mind. I think fundamentally um, in the Western kind of way that we're trained, uh, we're often not trained and we simply have no no ability currently to engage and to understand other ways of knowing and respecting other knowledges. And if you think of how we all trained, we're trained that only the written word counts, right? Until something is published, it's not true. And you need to put a stamp on your knowledge. And so how do you honor and how do you include other ways of knowing and oral histories and all of these things in your work? So on the very fundamental level, our training doesn't prepare us very well. Um, but then if we look more into the structures of the geoscience ecosystem, and I love that somebody mentioned how quick we have to do everything. Our funding cycles are maybe two years, five years, if we're lucky. Building trust and building relationships takes a long time. And so I work a lot with early career researchers, right? And I have a lot of researchers who are very interested in this type of work. And we have to have very honest conversations about if you do this and if you do it right, you might not get your publications very quickly, which is ultimately what the current system measures you by, right? And so if you are under the pressure of finding maybe a, a professorship or you are up for tenure, you have all these things in terms of measuring your productivity and it might not mesh up with how you want to do your work ethically. So if I had a big wish, I would love for us to move more towards what I would call slow science and just have time to think and time to talk to each other and learn from each other before we worry about productivity. But in the current ecosystem that we're in, I don't think that's well supported. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I'd like to pose the same question back to Wendy. Can you give us a response to this? Yeah, I think um, on a more sort of flat level, there's barriers ranging from, you know, blatant racism or preconceived ideas of the said communities, of local communities, and whether or not they're deserving of agency. And I think a lot of the time we can sort of revert ourselves when we're trying to be progressive into these ideas of the perfect local community, which is in harmony with its environment. And those are the kind of um, communities we need to be listening to and who deserves to be uplifted. But ultimately they don't need to be performing this, you know, perfect minority or perfect local community for us. Um, and on top of that, I think, uh, to also, I think, bring in what the first question was, I think, from Daniel, and talking about what happens when these communities aren't interested and when they don't want the research. And I think if we're going to give people the agency and say, do you want us to come in here and work and do on research on this area, we can't now take that agency away because they don't agree, because they don't want the research to happen. And while Obviously, there's still space for conversation, but I think we can't remove that agency away because we got the wrong answer. If local communities don't want you there, they don't want you there. Um, but yeah, I think to add on on what Rebecca said as well, I think there's a we're not sort of sure how to interact with public expertise. The way we look at expertise is you study for a certain amount of years, you publish the papers, you work with other researchers, but we don't actually have a way of interacting with what local knowledge is and what local expertise and sort of smaller fields or whatever fields might look like. And so how do you begin to bridge that between what we know as academia and what local people know as knowledge? Thank you. 
Um, do any of the other panelists want to jump in and respond to this? Yeah, I, I, I think this is a, um, I think exactly as Wendy said, I think this is a very complex topic. And, and one of the things I think I wanted to point to was um, some, some recent experience I've had through, um, and I know we're going to come on to the role of funding agencies in a moment, so I'm not going to dwell too much on that at this point, but I think it's pertinent to what Wendy said um, a moment ago, and, and we We've run a couple of events exactly for that reason of trying to engage local research communities as part of European funded projects. And, and also some large global initiatives have tried to run events and include researchers from certain regions. And, and one of the things that we've seen is if you try and actually encourage participation, and this I think also references what our speaker in the audience said, um, the question is why? Why do we want to be involved? Why do we care? But also that there's a much more subtle issue here. It's about actually feeling able to participate. And, and one of the things that we found, we, we saw this with a recent um, research data alliance plenary, there are they research data alliance for those people who don't know they have a plenary on a I think it's twice yearly basis and they rotate around the world and you you quite often do not see you know research communities from Africa South America really engaging with those initiatives but there was one workshop one plenary that was in Botswana in Africa and it was the only plenary where we actually saw active participation from local researchers. The main reason for this was because they didn't have the resources. They didn't, and going back to the comment from the audience, a real barrier to inclusion was capacity. And I think this is something, and I do want to come back to this when we talk about the role of funding agencies, but I really, I, what Wendy just said as well really resonates, but what was said in the audience, I think also resonates. It's, it's about, feeling that they can, they want to be involved, they can be involved, but also having actually the ability to be involved and feeling that it's relevant for them. And I think the fact that you get engagement involvement, if you provide the right environment in the right space with the right intention, then that's when you're really empowering that involvement because otherwise it becomes a barrier to inclusion, I think. Yes, th thank you, Helen. And I, I can add, um, capacity is a bit of a vague word, but I think we can really call this, it's um, actual cash flow and funding. If your funding is in a weak currency like Botswana and Pula, which is one of the strongest currencies on the continent, travel is very expensive and becomes a barrier. If needing to get a visa can take months and you get turned down at the last minute. So these are the, um, not just barriers, but this is the lived experience of many, many researchers actually probably it's not a minority experience, really. Um, we would now like to open this question to the audience. So please just come up to the microphone and fight it out when you get there. Um, <clears throat> hi, I'm Daniela, um, Chilean based in UK. And why not speak that one of the barriers is our own ego? Because in the sense that we believe we are the high, like the high knowledge and things like that. And we love collaboration. And I think many of us have spoke, spoke with each other and offer collaborations and co-authorships and published together and all that. Why not offer these local communities the authorship they deserve and not just put them in the acknowledged part? Thank you. Next. Hi, I'm James, University of Reading. Uh, I traveled here without needing to use a visa. Uh, last year, a colleague from my university got funding to attend EGU, but their visa was not accepted because they're from a country in Southeast Asia. Does EGU have a mechanism to record when this happens and report it to politicians that this has happened? So this is, this is actually a very timely comment because we've had a number of um, meetings with our sibling societies around the world. And one of the number one topics on that, um, on the agenda for that meeting is how can we address this issue of visas for attending meetings such as this, but also more widely for researchers because it's restricting the, the mobility of certain groups of, of researchers and, and researchers in dis different um, geographical regions. 
Um, in answer, a direct answer to the question is yes, we do record those um, instances where someone applies for a visa. We quite often ask for a letter of invitation in, to, in support of a visa application for coming to EGU. And um, so this is something that is, we have data on this, but actually EGU intends to be far more proactive than this. We're actually now talking about engaging with different agencies and different bodies that have an interest. So not just researchers, not just meeting organizers, but travel bureaus, but also getting a common voice that we can actually speak to the government agencies and say that, you know, for a variety of reasons, not just scientific participation, you know, this is a real barrier to inclusion. So the, the, the visa issue is a priority right now for EGU, in fact. Thank you, Helen. I have my brutal stopwatch going. So we, we probably have time for only two more questions from the audience. Okay, I, I was going to make a comment quickly about the previous question about why local researchers might have said no. Um, it could have also been a fear of tokenism, like if they agree, they might end up being the indigenous researcher that's always on panels talking about neocolonialism. And it's been documented in like women in tech, for example, that uh, if people end up spending a lot of time doing this, their actual works get sidelined and then they don't end up getting promoted and um, uh, it doesn't actually like benefit them in any way. So just wanted to comment on that. Yes, please. My name is Blaise, Blaise Mafuko from Congo. And then I uh, would like to share my experience about these barriers. Um, I started, I'm a volcanologist, and then I started my research before the recent eruption in 2021, and then after that. And then I had to work with students, also with uh, local communities, uh, leaders. And for that, uh, I'm doing my PhD in, in, in Belgium. Uh, and also we are like uh, having uh, an ethical consideration that I was like uh, going to to follow and then what i wanted to say here is like uh, trying to work with local communities and trying to ensure that their rights is they are preserved we are is like also in terms of like a paradox because trying to really want to ensure that their rights are preserved is also a kind of barrier because why uh they were like uh, an item for the ethical consideration that I was supposed to uh, to explain to these uh, community leaders and students. And after that, it was like uh, something which was um, conceived for Western people. And for them, it was like something which I was, they don't understand that what I was explaining to them. For example, if I have to take you a picture, you have to send somewhere, you have to agree with something and so on. And after that, they said, ah, it's become too uh, much and then you can try to stop because it's not in our culture. So what I wanted to say, it's good to talk about this question and these issues, but it's also, uh, we need to really to understand what are the differences between this community and maybe for our next uh, uh, session or next year and so on, why not to invite this uh, community and to understand really what are the way, how they understand and then how they, because we are trying to have solution for people who are not here. And are we really sure that we are having solution which is really, I don't, uh, <laughs> contextualized to this community. Sorry for taking too long, but it was something which is, for me, it was very important to share here. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing this. And uh, we agree with you completely. We try to have these colleagues with us. Unfortunately, this year we were not successful in that, but we will work on this more. And uh, so we need to build this trust, as we said. But thanks a lot for sharing. Thank you. Okay, we um, thank you to everyone who came to speak on that question. So we're going to move to our third one, which is what are the tools and mechanisms to advocate and amplify the voices and recognition of local knowledge in geoscience research? 
Um, so we've talked about the barriers, but now we're talking about some tools and mechanisms on a kind of a path to some best practice guidelines. So our first plan is to respond to this. I'd like to put this over to Anouk. Can you speak to this, please? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm going to answer this question from my perspective and the experience that I've had in building um, science together with local, local scientists. And um, I think one of the most important things what we've been talking already about is that we need to include them. So before submitting a grant proposal, or before starting um, your scientific work, your data collection, get in contact with the local scientists. I think that's the crucial part, which maybe seems uh, very evident, but it's not always done. And I think this is where we should be heading. And contact might not be easy to make. So if you have it, treasure it. It's very precious to have contact with the local communities. And I think then what is most important is we ask them, well, I ask them, like, what do you need? What um, kind of science are you looking for? What kind of um, tools can we share? Can we collaborate on? Um, I think it's really important to understand what the local scientists um, yeah, are looking for and put their needs maybe first and not mine, um, which kind of requires a change in perspective. And I think one of the sort of the tools that institutions or what my institution offers um, is signing things like a memorandum of understanding, which is sort of a legal contract, which um, allows both parties to work on the same data. And it gives the local scientists the, um, the ownership and also the, um, the kind of the authority to hold me accountable for the data that I use and the way I use it and the way I publish it. Which means that if I do something which is not fair or not equal, they can actually tell me like, hey, Anouk, we signed this contract. You're not doing this in an ethical way. Now we need to talk about this and make this better. So for me, these kind of um, agreements, um, I find them very useful. And it also, I have the impression that the the people I collaborate with, they um, they feel, um, well, I have the impression that we are at uh, more equal levels and they actually talk to me about things when they disagree with me. So they feel um, equal to me when I do my sign. So I think we should look for these kind of very practical solutions um, to include them as um, like full scientists, which they are, of course, um, yeah, when we are working outside of our home countries. I guess I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you, Anouk. So I, I just want to follow up so that it's really clear what you're talking about with this kind of um, very early discussion and even going as far as a memorandum of understanding. This is between yourself as a geoscientist and other geoscientists in the country where you want to go. Exactly. Country. Yeah. So it's a very kind of very local, as in between me and the local scientists agreement. It's very small act, I would say, because it only affects me and the local scientists, but it has a big impact in the end on how the science is conducted and how it will be brought into the world. Um, and then just another follow-up question. So from your experience, you're doing this in the very early stages of building a research project. So the kind of direction that that research is going in, um, are you saying that you're working with you and your collaborators um, are working together from these early stages. Yes, yeah. So before I even go into the field, I make sure that these that the contact is there, that we both understand the conditions under which we conduct our data acquisitions and our science, um, and then the memorandum of understanding is preferably signed before. Yeah. yeah. Um. So I'm really keeping her on the spot. Can you? Um. This is. A, sounds so positive, but how, can I ask you how it's gone? Like, has it gone well? Has it gone badly? Can you speak to that? So you mean the, the signing of the thing itself? It's gone, well, it's actually a good question because it's a bureaucratic procedure, which takes long, unfortunately. So in one case, it took more than a year from, but this is on the institutional level that it took very long to find the right people to sign it. But once it was signed, everything was very fast. So it's still in our institutions sometimes that we can, yeah, I think we can speed things up. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask um, Tim to respond to this question as well, please. Um, thank you. Yeah, I, I second Anouk's point. Um, and as a research infrastructure 
provider, I guess we try to find ways that we can um, ensure that people who use our infrastructures engage with local communities when they're doing that. And look, to be honest, it's really hard and we, we don't quite know the right way to do that yet. So we are trying to write into contracts uh, that, that researchers are bound by when they use our research infrastructure statements that ensure that they engage meaningfully with local communities. Um, but I'll be honest, it's it's very new and it's hard and it's hard to get the lawyers to engage on it and it's hard to get the wording right uh, on our contracts to make it meaningful and not tokenistic. Um, so I think that is a challenge, but it's, it's an opportunity as well. Um, I think that finding long-term funding for groups that operate in this space within Indigenous communities um, is really important as well. So there's a there's a, a, a program in Australia called uh, Indigenous Rangers, um, and these are, are groups of Indigenous people who monitor environmental change and they uh, do ecological sampling and, and various other pieces of work in the oceans and um, in coastal regions particularly. Uh, and finding long-term funding for these groups to um, provide a real mechanism for researchers who come in, as we said, on these really short timescales where we've got a three-year grant and we want to pop in and do something and then pop out, but to make sure that there are local communities that are operating with long-term secure funding, I think, is, is a real um, opportunity as well. Um, and I think there's an appetite for that within government, certainly in Australia at the moment. Um, and I think the other thing is, again, the point's been made a number of times before, but for us to get out of the mindset of the way we do science is the only way to tell the story. Um, so within Oscope, when we do large uh, sort of geophysical projects and things now, um, we try to get Indigenous artists and residents to work with us on those projects and to create whatever it is that they want to create as part of that collaboration. Um, and again, you know, it, there's always a risk that these things feel seem tokenistic, and I was worried about that when we started doing that. But the reality is, I don't think they are. They're telling a story in a different way, and it relates to the science that we're doing that that they have some interest in, but not the same interest that we do. But the opportunity that that collaboration and that engagement has provided to the geoscientists involved and the and the people involved in those projects has been um, enormous, I think. So sort of looking outside the square as, as to ways to, to uh, engage. Thank you, Tim. And I'd, I'd now like to turn this question over to the audience. Please come up to the microphone, introduce yourself, give us your response. Hello, Fiona Johnson from UNSW in Australia. Um, I think one tool, but it actually comes back to the barriers as well, that we've seen recently is we were invited to the Cook Islands last year um, to do some science expo, you know, outreach kind of work. But while we were there, we met with the climate change department and, and they see researchers coming all the time and there being no benefit at all. And so they've decided to, to turn it on their head and essentially they're developing the research strategy in partnership with some, you know, with some partners. Um, and then there's ethics approval boards as well. So I think it's a two prong approach, but it also gets back to the barriers because their climate change department for the whole country has five staff in it. And so, you know, that, that process has been really slow because of capacity. And, and we were talking before you were talking before about monetary capacity, but actually I think one of the biggest impacts of that monetary capacity comes in time capacity that that people don't have enough time in their day in local communities and and it comes back to these ideas of being invited onto panels and that taking away from other time that time is is really finite more than money in some ways and so I think that is a really big barrier thank you Hello, everyone. I am uh, Hazar Shukrani. I am a PhD student from Morocco. I do a co tutel thesis as well as in France, in Institut Agro Montpellier, Sirat. And I summarize a little bit some tools and mechanisms, and I would also answer the first two questions. So first of all, I think we should all be transparent. What is the level of participation when you want to uh, ask people to participate? Do you mean you want to inform them? 
do you want do you mean you want to consult them or to concertate with them so this is the first uh, step what is the level of the participation you're seeking from these local communities as well as uh, like for example uh, when i started my phd i went to the field and a farmer told me Whoa, I, I think you're here collecting data and just uh, leaving us like uh, the rest of the researchers did. So they have the assumptions like researchers come and collect data, they make out of it money and they leave, which is something uh, I think it's uh, true. Uh, sometimes researchers think that they are more superior and they own uh, all the knowledge. Why it, it is really important to know that there is some local and important knowledge that we do not know. And uh, second, uh, what is your priority? Because sometimes in, for example, European countries, you have some priorities and different uh, research questions you want to answer that it might not be the same like in Africa or Asia or America. So I think we should put ourselves in the place of local communities and ask them, what are your priorities so we can work together? And, uh, and for example, I think when we want to go to the field, we should not uh, tell them, Okay, so this is, I think, this is how you can engage yourself, but more reformulate the question and ask them, how do you think you can engage yourself with us? How do you think you can uh, give your inputs to uh, for this project or the research? And also we should have, I think, uh, be armed with the ethical values. I am glad that uh, like uh, in February, I had a workshop at Belgium in the University uh, uh, University Catholique de Louvain, and it was about the ethical dilemmas. Sometimes we go to the field and we forget that uh, the territory is not, uh, the field is not a virgin territory. There are cultures, there are religions, there are many different things, and we come and we try to impose ourselves to the other people. So we should be uh, conscious about the, all the differences and uh, these diversities and uh, Last but not least, I think we should all have uh, like uh, humility and we should know that when we go to the field, we are also a subject of a research of the local communities. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for sharing with, uh, with us your thought. Just one uh, very quick comment. Um, I, I, I suspect that in many of our universities, our students are taking ethic course. It would be nice to add this topic uh, instead of just adding uh, ethics on how to publish, how to treat the data and, and stuff like that, but also having this topic in the course ethic, which we provide to the students in the different university. Um, yes, please. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Simone. I am half Ecuadorian, half German, so have always moved within the both worlds, getting to see the best and the worst. And um, a comment I want to also like to empower everyone in this room is to actually also um, like open this topic with the communities you're working with, with the locals you're working with, with the stakeholders. You're, I mean, it's nice that we are talking right now here about this, but I mean, it's also for, for me, it's part of the transparency with especially like the global south to put this on the table to ask about their experiences, because the experience I have had is that, for example, many farmers are like, yeah, we have had bad experiences, but what else can we do? And there is where I see myself, not just like a researcher, but also like a, a human being who is just like invading being there for a certain amount of time to empower them to say, you have a voice, you can decide and vote. And even like when you're having a bad experience, say it, talk about it, put it on the table and don't just go on with your life and just like let everything happen and and not like uh, be able to to say anything thank you thank you um all right going to move on to our next question which is this is a big one how can research funding help geoscientists construct meaningful and fair scientific exchange with local communities where international science is conducted and I think, again, I want to stress that by local communities, we really mean two things, um, the local geoscience communities and the local people who just happen to be living there. 
So I'm going to hand this one back over to the EG Vice President, to Helen. So can you give us your response to this, please? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Robin. Um, so I, I kind of, this is quite a, a, a topic in a way that's close to my heart, because I think um, over the years I've had a number of research grants and while you know there's been a shift towards this idea of the fact that we should be more inclusive in terms of who is involved in the research we we tend even now to be to be seeing sort of these sort of um tokenism was a fantastic word that was used both in the audience and i think one of the panelists we see comments like um um you know the inclusion of partners from africa Will, um, will be positively um, reviewed, but actually doesn't actually tell you what that means. And this, I, this is a problem because this then actually to a certain extent, and Rebecca, you, you alluded to this in your response earlier, the nature of these research grants demands fast science. So what actually happens is the researchers then think, well, how can I tick this box that I've got my African partner. And one of the things that I think is missing in all of this and is still missing in all of this is then actually really looking at what does that mean in terms of how have you involved local researchers in this proposal? And there is still no positive evaluation of that aspect, but the pressure is on the researcher to find a partner, to tick a box, to secure a research grant. And while we still have this paradigm of fast research and ticking boxes without any meaningful evaluation of research grant proposals, we're actually potentially perpetuating neo-colonialism because there's no consideration of how we really include lo the local communities in the research. We're just being encouraged to tick a box, find a partner, but actually many of the evaluation processes, and in fact, I, I won't mention any names, but I have recently been involved in a review panel for a set of proposals where the question was simply to the reviewers, could you please comment about the makeup of the research com community that will conduct this research with particular reference to confirm the inclusion of a partner from the Global South? That was it. That was the to totality of that evaluation of that aspect of the, the research. That paradigm is not going to construct meaningful engagement with local researchers. What the funding agencies and those who are providing funding research need to be doing absolutely want to echo what Rebecca said. There needs to be an understanding that the pace of research needs to slow down to allow, allow that meaningful engagement. But we need to set realistic expectations of what that engagement looks like but also make sure that the funding agencies really understand, and this again echoes what we've heard from the audience, they understand actually the relevance of that research, the need of the local communities, but it's really about making sure there's awareness rather than just going, you need to find a partner from the Global South, you need to deliver these deliverables within this time frame. This will never create a fair and inclusive research environment where we're truly engaging with our partners in you know that are local and within the local communities so I, I i probably am never getting another research grant in my life now but i genuinely believe there really needs to be a shift in the mindset of our funding agencies to understand that we we have to have some local awareness we have to understand how this is relevant and not encourage researchers to just find some random partner within a country to support the, the, the acquisition of their latest research grant, because this actually, you know, this is not inclusive science. It will never be inclusive science. Thank you, Helen. And I, I can respond to that as an African, African researcher, because Africa is a continent. Uh, Africa is a country, right? Um, where I've had in European and American grant writing season, it's normally about two weeks before the deadlines, I get floods of emails because people are trying to tick a box and they need a partner. And I'm white 
So I get a lot of these because I think I'm a kind of easy partner. I step between these worlds more easily. So, um, yes, back to Anouk's comment of like a year of um, discussion and interaction building up towards a co-created proposal is a lovely way of approaching a best practice. An email two weeks before the deadline is basically not. Um, does Do any of the other panelists want to respond to this? Rebecca, do you have something to say? Um. Yeah, maybe just building on it. So in, in 2021, I did a rotation at the National Science Foundation, which is one of the largest funding agencies in the United States, because I really wanted to see the other side of where the money comes from. And so I served as a program officer there. And I was invited to contribute to a new solicitation, so like a grant opportunity. And um, with my colleagues, we developed what I think it was one of the first requirements uh, for a grant application to include a community engagement plan. And it needed to be more than the checkbox or calling you uh, and, and a week before the grant is due, but it really had to be developed together with wherever you were going and whoever you were engaging. And, um, the United States, it could have been maybe like a local community, it could be an indigenous community, it could be some work abroad. And it needed to be backed up with letters of collaboration from a tribe or from the communities. And that will be evaluated by the panelists. And we had a long discussion about who needs to then be on the review panel and, and look at these criteria. It cannot be the usual crowd that we usually invite to review research uh, proposals. So I think there is a shift happening. It's very slow, um, but I think the intent is there. It's, it's just gonna take a lot of time. I just wanted to uh, bring a couple of personal experience. Um, last year, actually, during the Union Symposium, we had two indigenous colleagues from uh, the Chiquitano local community in Mato Grosso, Brazil. And the reason for that, because at the time I had a project with uh, uh, those indigenous colleagues involved. The project is for three years, but it took us almost seven years to build up the trust to have uh, them involved. So it's not something that you do in two weeks. So this means that we really need to educate ourselves at different level, providing courses, sharing information because the information are there and uh, we really need to yeah put a little bit of effort in that and then i wanted to comment briefly on what rebecca just said about the community engagement plan uh, when you write proposal trying to involve locals yeah sometimes it is specifically written community engagement plan not only outreach because very often we just say okay let's do just just provide a couple of seminars to schools and to local community but it's not that I mean, this can be part of it, but it's not that. And uh, so we need to start uh, being a bit more creative and co-create the knowledge and co-create also these actions with our colleagues. Thank you. We've got a little bit of time to turn this back to the audience. And I just wanted to check in. Is there anything coming through online? I do have, can you hear me? <coughs> Can you hear me? We, no. we don't have a mic. There, there is one that's not related to this uh, question. So there's going to be a general discussion. Yes, okay. So I'll hold it for then. Um, to our online participants, you are more than welcome to respond to Thank these. You. We'd really like to hear from you as well. But yes, please, at the mic. Hi, um, Rebecca Williams. I'm UK based. And I think one of the most fundamental things our funders can do, or those that I've had experience with engaging with, is to allow us to include um, international um, scientists as actual collaborators. We aren't able to put them on many of our grant proposals as co-investigators. They go down as project partners. And with that, the funding doesn't follow. So it's actually really challenging to allow the funding to leave the UK and go to those collaborators. They're seen as some sort of distinct category. And so there I am budgeting on my time, 
budgeting on time for a research associate, but I can't budget on their time. They're expected to give it as an in-kind contribution. And that is fundamentally inequitable. And I think that's one of the biggest barriers that we face. We had the GCRF um, funding scheme, the Global Challenges Research Scheme, and that was the first one that we were able to transfer money. Um, there was a huge, fundamentally problematic due diligence process to go through that to uh, demonstrate that those international institutions were um, trustworthy, which is a whole other, I think, um, situation. And in that case, we were able to pay things like the research associates, the collaborators' time, um, money for, for dongles, for internet access, all these kind of research costs that we don't have in our, our privileged position. But that funding scheme's now ended. Um, and that's those um, situations we're not allowed to put on to many of our other um, funding schemes. And that would be my, um, my biggest um, request from our bodies if they want us to do equitable international science, which we must do. Thank you. I mean, if you want wanted an example of neo-colonialism, um, I believe we've got something coming through online. I've got two questions. I have one that's related to this. It's from Nabanita Bora, who is an independent researcher based in India. And she's asking, um, is, is EGU um, listing funding information uh, at a common place? She apologizes because um, uh, she gets lost in the information on the web page. And so I guess maybe, you know, there's uh, this aspect of, you know, how do, you know, scientists from these communities attend to your scientific conferences here and what can EGU do to facilitate that? I think I caught that. I think I caught that. So, I mean, with regards to actually facilitating participation in EGU, we have a number of schemes for participation from those in, in low and middle income countries. We have travel schemes. We have a, in fact, we're working on a new waiver scheme right now, which will allow even more people to be able to apply to participate in our conferences, because we are very sensitive to the fact that those in low and middle income countries are not, uh, they don't have access to the level of funding that many of us have. And so we, we, we are very cognizant of the need to actually provide some additional support to those who want to attend EGU. But it's also the reason that we are very, very committed to our hybrid format because we, we've noted since we moved to a hybrid format that we are able to, we are able, we're seeing more participation from those people who don't have access to the resources to be able to come to the meeting. So there are a range of actions that we're seeking to make EGU more inclusive. Um, I don't want to digress into the whole hybrid discussion, but we are seeing much more participation. So that's another thing that we, we want to develop for the future. We're a little short on time, but what's the other, you want to do the other question? Yeah, the other one comes from uh, Caroline Johansson, um, and she talks RE perpetuating neocolonialism and shifting funding agency. She says she works for a non-profit organization, Interchange, based in Germany, that receives funding from a European funding agency. Uh, while spreading the word about one of our projects, the Deep Network virtual poster on Friday, there's a plug, um, the president of Pan-African Vision for the Environment, Pave in Nigeria, contacted her with very similar ideas that he wants to implement. They were both excited about the possibility of an intercontinental collaboration, and he was very honest from the beginning that from his side, the funding was the problem. And after looking into options, the difficulty from the German side was also funding. Many of the funding possibilities seemed very much like missionary style. Uh, projects where the colonial countries can go in, teach the people there, and then we come back to our respective countries. Other ways to get funding for these more inclusive types of uh, collaborations. Yeah, I actually, as, as I said in, in my response a few moments ago, I, I think that I, I completely agree with, I didn't catch the name of the person with the question, but I, I think we have to be really careful actually that 
with our current funding models and those the, the expectations of our funding agencies, we are in real danger of perpetuating neo-colonialism. Neo so one of the things that I think all of us here need to do is to really reinforce the importance of proper and appropriate engagement with local research communities, but also make sure that, and I, I also want to reference the, the speaker who just commented, we also need to make sure that funding agencies don't create barriers to participation through setting unrealistic expectations. I actually completely recognize what was mentioned about building trust not with the researchers, but actually with the funding agencies. I have, I've I've got a couple of really bitter experiences that I won't go into here, where I've identified really good partners in low and middle income countries. And then the, the, the funding agency involved who will remain nameless basically asked me to demonstrate that they were a valid and appropriate partner. I spent six months trying to find out what valid and appropriate partner meant. And in that time, I missed the deadline for the proposal submission. But actually what it was, it was a case of saying, how do we, it was a very roundabout way of saying, we want to be sure that you're not sending money to another organization and we are not getting any value for that investment. And then the trust, going back to Juliana's comment, I think we need to rethink trust and the definition of that word for the funding agencies as well, because we have a real problem with that at the moment, and it's become a barrier in itself. Thank you, Helen. Um, I'm afraid we need to move on to our next question, but there's going to be more discussion at the end. So please come back to the microphone. You can get the, the first spot. So our um, final question, which is something we've been alluding to and kind of touched on is, how could changes to institutional structures help geosciences scientists conduct science, including local communities? Um, and our initial phrasing of this question was, how could institutional structures um, help geoscientists? And we realized we actually needed um, the, the status quo, the way our structures are at the moment is so problematic that we actually rephrased the question to be, how could changes to institutional structures help? Um, so for this, I'd like to pass um, the, this to our panelist, Anouk, to get her response, particularly as an early career scientist. Yeah, thanks. It's, a, it's quite a complicated question, isn't it? Because the institutional structures, they are so solid and static and unmoving. And so if you want to get more equality within our own structures already, I don't know, sometimes I, I don't even know where to begin. Um, I guess in the end, it all comes down that um, the way we conduct science in uh, in the Western world is all very focused on our benefit and on our, what we want to get out of it. And I think we need to think more in an altruistic way where we go more into the redistribution of time, of money, of tools, of, um, of resources, basically. Um, and this can start with, I guess, kind of some relatively concrete actions on how to build trust. That was one of the um, one of the things that was mentioned that the building trust with the local scientists is something that we need to invest in. One thing I heard uh, last week during one of the conversations I had is that when we try to uh, set up collaborations with uh, local communities, we often use English as a common language, um, but English is maybe not necessarily the language in which the local scientists like to communicate in which they understand. Um, so one thing that I guess institutions could do is provide translators, for example, which are very broadly um, educated on different languages to provide agreements in local languages so that people feel um, recognized and understand what the agreement in the end will be. So I guess it's maybe these kind of small changes that can Kind of modify this very solid structures that we have and make them like kind of make little holes in them to make um, these changes they will be slow but it will help and it will create more space and room for people from all over the world to collaborate with us thanks thank you Anouk. um rebecca we're also curious to hear your response to this 
yeah, I, I really love your ideas. And I'm thinking like, yes, these, was not my idea these, these structures are so in place and it feels overwhelming trying to change them. But I do believe that we first need to get our own house in order before um, we can do anything else. And a couple of things come to mind. First, I think we need to get better at even as geoscientists reaching out and doing and accepting interdisciplinary work more. And we are having a hard time even talking to each other sometimes in subdisciplines. But how many social scientists other than myself are here today? And do we have more people who already think um, about these kind of problems in different ways? And who are we bringing in and just starting to be more interdisciplinary? I think that's the first step. Then we need to educate ourselves more in cultural competencies. We need to understand issues like data sovereignty. Um, so again, back, I think you said that early, very early in this debate, educating ourselves starting there first. And then I think those of us who, who can uh, need to advocate for change in institutions. So we challenge tenure structures and tenure promotion processes. Um, we need to challenge what we value in the community and how we measure if we're doing good work. And if we continue to measure and think good work means to cranking out a million publications um, a year, I think we're on the wrong path. I had a wonderful conversation yesterday with somebody about changes made in, in Ireland where you have to demonstrate impact versus output in your research. And so really thinking about what's your impact. If you look back at a career of your last 10 years, what really mattered what you do? So I think these are big questions. And I think a lot of people who are holding on to these institutional structures won't be happy if we try to challenge them. But I think ultimately that's what we need to do. And, and again, back to this, we need to slow down and we need to stop rushing from two-year grants to five-year grants and jumping back and around because that will just keep us in this very colonial, very um, kind of white privilege space that got us in trouble in the first place. So yeah, I don't know, something short of a revolution maybe. <laughs> we need to be radical disruptors who do slow science. Um, I think what we need to do now is um, move on so um to wrap up the panel side and the egu side um this was part of the egu statement which was released to mark earth day which was a uh, basically a pledge from egu to continue um i'm not going to read this out but to continue working in this space um and part of that is really to hear from the members of EGU. As Juliana said, this is a bottom-up society, and what we really want to do is to hear from you. So you have various opportunities. There's the people in the room, the people online. Um, come to the microphone, give us your response to any of these questions to the panel. Um, we also have a Slido, if you would prefer to make these comments quietly speaking at a microphone is not for everybody. Um, and I really want to encourage you, don't hold back. We would like all sorts of criticisms, ideas, um, you know, offers to be conveners next year. You know, we really want to hear from you. This is your opportunity to have your say. So the, um, we have 20, 25 minutes, the mics are open. Please, can we hear from you? Yes. <coughs> Um, as I said before, please briefly introduce yourselves and please be mindful to the fact that many people have a say. So this is not your moment for a 10 minutes um, monologue. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Make your so, points. Yes. Thank you. My name is David. Uh, yeah, I work in, in, in London, that's in Berry College. I'm also from Ecuador, which is very surprising. A lot of Ecuadorians here. So yeah, I was I was just uh, trying to comment on, on all the questions, and uh, I I am going to highlight like few words that we're like kind of uh, use all the time here, which which is involve, include, and recognize. So I reckon like that those words already imply like a kind of a 
different relational powers and roles between European institutions and 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 the global south. So I don't know. I I reckon that it would be nice at some point if uh, institutions from the global south would be able to apply to European grants, and then like if if they are if they don't consider only the name of the institution, we get the we get the funds, and then one of the conditions might be might be yes, you can get you can get the money, but you should include a European institution. So I I reckon that would be nice. I mean level the court because we are playing a rigged game. So yeah. Just that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maybe hi. we can alternate. My Sorry. <laughs> um, my name is Christian. I'm from Peru. Uh, so I think uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about the, the last question about how you change the structure to promote this, um, I guess, inclusivity and diversity. But then I heard always that you've been talking about uh, collaborations or agreements that probably for the other people they would be use, uh, useless. Uh, but then it it is a bit funny that you want to talk about diversity with within a white uh, kind of atmosphere, but without having actually diversity in the structure. So how do you manage to, okay, not only work with local communities but also have people diversity in the institutions? not getting worried not only to give a quota but also to give a plan a career plan to have a voice in the higher atmosphere of the institution for example so how is it something that you consider also when you talk about changes in the structure is structure sorry infrastructure or only talk about uh how i'm gonna be uh, these agreements at the end of my project but well thank you Do any of the panelists want to respond to this? How do we get diversity further up? Maybe maybe I can say something about it. So I'm based in the Netherlands and in the Netherlands, I think as of last year, we have a quota for um, to get gender balance. And I do not see why we could not include such a quota for including diversity on different demographics. So yeah, I think this is totally part of the discussion and it's a very valid point that you made. And I think we should, Mount that as well from our institutions. Thanks. Hi, I'm Felix. I'm from the UK. Um, I'm not sadly here to propose any solutions, but to point out potentially that the problem runs a bit deeper than has been discussed in that we've not talked much outside of brief mention of ethics courses about what happens at sort of the undergrad teaching level. Um, I don't know how common this is internationally, but I know in the UK um, to do any kind of geology course, you're required to do a mapping project. And in a lot of institutions, including the University of Cambridge, right in my undergrad, you go abroad for that. Um, at no stage in any part of the planning of that was any mention made of collaboration with locals. The closest it got was, oh, these people in the department have been there before, talk to them. And I think when the way that it's taught at an undergrad level, when you're sort of first coming up through the system, if the approach is you go there, you find a roof to put over your head for six weeks, you get the data and then you come back and work on it even to the point of, you know, you take samples and work on them here, with no mention that it's even worth considering talking to locals, I, I think potentially we need structural change from earlier than has been already mentioned. Thanks, Felix. I, I fortunately I cannot show you my notes, but I have uh, written here, ethic course, neocolonialism, and then I have a square around it. The reason for that is because I think that maybe this can be done at the union level, right? Involving our early career scientists and asking the early career scientists, do you get this kind of training within the ethic course at your university? Yes or no? Once we have this answer, then we can contact the university. We can share the material that we have. We can prepare a package maybe or using a short course, the one that have been organized uh, to be shared because this is exactly the point. I mean, we are now discussing about this, but the early career scientists, which are those that very often go to the field and da, 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 they don't know what this is about. And uh, so I think that in terms of, you're absolutely right. We need to uh, also establish this topic in the ethic course that we provide to the, that we provide to the students in the different universities. Sorry, I, I hope this isn't going to be too depressing. I have no memory of ever being given an ethics course in my undergrad at any ah, stage. Okay, so this is even worse. But <laughs> and so maybe we should start. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Thank you. It's very well taken, and this is undergraduates who are literally being talk about neo-colonial practices, 
um, you know, so and and if we think about research ecosystems and recent research um, kind of practices that are accepted in an institution, and so what you're saying is from an undergraduate level, people are in a very implicit way being taught this is how you do fieldwork. So thank you for raising that. It's well taken. I think Helen would also like to respond. Yeah, I, I want to thank Felix for, for raising this issue because I think it's it's a really important one. And, and I'm involved in a, 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 a an advisory group, a network group in the UK for a UK university. And, and one of the, the, the roles of that group, and if Rich Pankost is online listening, he, he knows I'm talking about his initiative. Um, but one, one of the things around that group is about you know, teaching of geoscience, and and uh, the point is well taken, um, but it is, I think, something we're already thinking about is, you know, ethics and teaching ethics to the next generation. As a parent of somebody who's currently an undergraduate, I completely agree with the point you've just made. It, it's not even on the, the, the radar of, of a lot of, you know, teaching, certainly in the UK. I only have experience of te undergraduate teaching in the UK, but I think we have a long way to go. And, and I think there's a role for EGU to play here. Um, we have, we have a, a lot of professors here. We have a lot of people who are educators here. And, and we need to remind them that this is, this, this, you know, these ethical practices are something that they should be promoting and encouraging and making sure they are embedded in the mindset of the next generation of, of, of space and planetary science scientists, but not just in geosciences, but across the board. This could be a topic for the education committee together with the EDI committee for next year. Um, I think we've got an online question. But I think we've still had the person who was giving a question before. Yes, let's, yeah, yes. <laughs> ah, uh, hello. Uh, well, first I want to say that uh, it's awesome that there are so many people here because that shows that uh, there are people that care about these type of topics and that's already, it's amazing. So first that. Uh, second, I consider myself extremely lucky, uh, probably one of the luckiest participants here, um, because my supervisor is actually a person that uh, it's a, also is you medalist, so she's very good, but she has also been working in, uh, in, uh, in projects in other countries for more than 20 years. So a person that has been working in projects, international projects for 20 years probably will as were these questions better than me, so I am just PhD student, and luckily she is not here. So <laughs> she, um, uh, she also is the person that recommend me to use notes before speaking, so that I can <laughs> say this better, um, this type of things better. But not for this, fortunately, because she doesn't know I am here. Uh, well, first, uh, what I can say to the panel and to the people here that are worried about these type of things is from the experience I see to my, uh, from my supervisor is that creating meaningful uh, exchanges with the different partners around the globe takes time. First, so if you will have ever experienced something like that, don't, and it has been not an easy or, an, or it has been a negative experience. I hope that this doesn't discourage you, but actually makes you, it makes your feeling about participating with other people stronger. So first, that's uh, it. Just courage, uh, people just have courage for doing this. Uh, that's the first part. And second, uh, about the questions, uh, the level of participations. Uh, we have gone from in participations and collaborations, it has gone from just take my samples, please do an analysis in your awesome equipment that I don't have in my lab, uh, to uh, things that include collaborations like me. And it's, uh, I am taking an example, what I did in the program that my supervisor and other people from 
the beautiful Selubain created, and along with Lish and other universities, long periods of collaboration uh, that was to a point where they have programs where uh, young teachers can integrate to science here that come as PhD students, master students, and exchange of students just for short courses or short periods. That helps because once you come here and learn what is possible to do in science, you are a different person. It's a totally different experience to learn science in South America, in Africa, in Asia, and come here. So I encourage you to try to do those type of things. Uh, additionally, tools, mechanism, uh, and participation in projects and money. Well, first, one of the important things that could be nice is how the transfer of knowledge can be replied uh, to different types of things. We have already talked about the students, but also about communities and what that information can be useful for them for the normal activities. And also uh, about coming here, uh, still is the global south. So coming here is an adventure when you are, when there is no proper uh, Schengen agreement done. So you still have to do a lot of the, the documents to come here. Uh, also, uh, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, Uh, it's difficult. Uh, it's interesting to see uh, exchange in technology. Things that I have learned here, I have bought here. I can travel, and I can buy now in Ecuador. That things I can do. Uh, uh, it helps a lot uh, to create the transfer of uh, uh, of information. Uh, uh, to the point that the agreements that now we have also included uh, yeah, doing projects and coming and okay. yeah, just yeah. to wrap up things, uh, yeah, I understand that uh, working in other countries, it's still a lot of administrative and security and even in some cases for female gender problems. Uh, so say I salute all the scientists that still go and work in other countries, so I... Thank you very much for sharing. Thanks. Please. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity in this panel. I don't know if you can... Uh, um, yeah, I think I've been here in this room actually uh, for almost a week now, and Mostly what I have seen, to be honest, is the EGU congratulating itself on being inclusive, diverse, uh, giving out medals, having at least one or two slightly critical panels. But what I've mostly also seen is 23 division medals giving, uh, given out to 20 white European researchers, 21 males, to be honest, um, which is a scandal. Well, in of itself, I have seen an organization that actually makes huge profits, which I wasn't aware of, uh, while at the same time giving hurdles and only awarding scholarships or funds for very selected individuals, uh, instead of making them widely uh, available, especially for people who do not have the funds. I have talked to a lot of young career scientists, especially from the global south, who said that colleagues couldn't come because they didn't receive funding, especially not only for, I don't know, the funds for the EGU membership, but also for accommodation, for visas, for, I don't know, child support, for flights for their uh, children. I have seen, I don't know, um, <laughs> the most ironic thing was that I've seen a medal lecture, I won't name names, that was mostly concerned with technologies that could be used to exploit more uh, resources, um, where the end of the lecture was that the suggestion would be that after it was used in uh, science, it could be commercialized and sold to companies. And we all know who will profit from this technology as 
and we all know which uh, communities will suffer from these technologies. And so, I don't know, I think I just want to open the floor um, to other people criticizing the EGU because I can only speak from my experience. I can not imagine how it feels if you're actually affected by all these things. And yeah, um, I guess I just feel like I haven't seen a lot of actual willingness for change and a lot more talk about their own, well, leading, I mean, Ms. Vase, I'm sorry, but you started this meeting with 15 minutes of talking about how the EGU is leading the way in diversity and decolonizing the geosciences instead of actually, I don't know, maybe reflecting and criticizing your own mistakes. And now other people have to come and do that. And I don't see a lot of self-reflection. I'm sorry. And then? So, so I, I, I actually want to, to thank you for raising a number of these issues because um, they are under constant review by EGU Council. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure that there is maybe as much transparency about our internal processes as there should be. And in fact, we're, again, we're addressing this, but I wanna to come to the first point about diversity of our awards and medals, because one of the things that we have been really struggling with is indeed the diversity of our awards and medals. Um, Juliana knows full well, because Juliana has been on council as, as has a nook in the past, and one of the biggest problems that we still have with our awards and medals is the diversity that you see of our awards and medals reflects actually the diversity of our nominations. The problem we really have is that, unfortunately, even now, those who are nominated for our medals are quite often senior white males. I say this as somebody who received an EGU medal in 2016, I think, Juliana. And if you, if you look at the picture of my award ceremony, I am one of two women on the stage. And it was actually the reason that I stood to become EGU president because I was really unhappy. I've also been a victim of discrimination throughout my career as a woman geoscientist. So I am really passionate about the issues that you've highlighted and we, we are making changes, but actually we need our members to help us make those changes because diversity of our awards and medals, I absolutely agree with you. I was really unhappy about the diversity of this year's cohort of awards and medals because once again, it is very male dominated. And I was really grateful to one of our citationists for actually raising this because I think it was important once again to flag it. And I'm actually grateful to you because it actually gives me a platform to encourage everyone here to think about nominating your peers. If we look at the diversity at this panel, I'm, I'm sorry, Tim, 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 you know, we, we, we're actually sort of not gender diverse in reality, but it doesn't reflect our membership. What it concerns me is that actually it reflects the people in our membership who are truly passionate about these topics. So again, we need to think about engaging more of our membership in these conversations, but also not just those people like us who are really passionate and, and really want to make changes. I also wanted to address your comment about empowering and enabling people to participate in EGU, we have a range of support schemes and we're actually looking at expanding the travel support. We're looking at expanding waivers because we do want to give the opportunity for more people to participate. There's been a number of conversations this week about the hybrid model for meetings to allow more people to be able to join the meeting remotely. It's worth saying that, you know, there are a number of conversations happening about how we can improve the experience for everyone who's involved. Um, but I think the most important thing for us right now is making sure that we continue these conversations, but actually we're very transparent about these things. And, you know, and, and I think for me, and unfortunately I'm outgoing president, so I have, you know, decreasing influence in these matters and I won't be around in a year's time, but, 
I think these are the things we need to keep raising, we keep, need to keep reinforcing, and we need to keep evaluating. Juliana said at the start of this great debate that EGU is a bottom-up organization, and this is why we welcome criticism, criticism from our members. We really, really welcome you know, the views of everyone, and criticism is the thing that will make us better. Could I just quickly respond to that? Uh, I will let the, uh, the chair decide on that. Briefly, because our very, time is finished, and briefly. I really wanted to hear yeah. also your colleagues. Yeah. yeah, thanks for your, well, extensive answer. But I think what mostly I am, and maybe also other people are looking for, is for somebody at the EGU to say, yes, you're right. We're sorry that it's not perfect. And I know that you have travel grants, but maybe admit that they're not enough, maybe admit that there might, might have been mistakes and not respond by saying what's been done or what will be done. Yeah, uh, well, I can briefly comment on this. As, as you said, and as we said, is you as a bottom-up organization, everyone here is volunteer. And this is what we do, which is, uh, yeah, takes us, takes a lot of time of, uh, in addition to our job, our family and so on. So of course we accept the criticism, but at the same time, I would like to say that every, everyone here is volunteer. And I can assure you that the division president and, and everyone, the conveners, everyone, it, everyone is really putting quite a lot of effort in all this, in this organization, but yeah. So maybe this should be more visible. Can I just say, Juliana, I'm more than happy to engage a more extensive conversation with you as well to, to have you know, some better insight because obviously we have limited time here. All right. <coughs> thank you for this discussion and thank you for the criticism. Um, we are out of time, but we have two people at the mic. So please come forward. We really want to hear from you. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Taro Sande and I work here in Austria. Um, uh, what I wanted to ask from the, the panelists uh, uh, was whether you have some uh, good examples of uh, increasing inclusion by actually embracing interdisciplinarity. Uh, I work uh, a lot in the field of citizen science uh, and uh, I've had to step out of my comfort zone very often uh, because I've seen that uh, it's not enough to be an environmental scientist, it's not enough to be a soil scientist. I also need to step into the world of computer science or I also need to step into the world of uh, understanding individual learning outcomes. So could you respond to experiences that you've uh, seen uh, how research organizations uh, can improve inclusive, uh, including local communities by uh, embracing the interdiscipl interdisciplinary uh, way of doing research. Thank you very much. I think what we've done, we've written down your question and we will um, continue in our 2024 program and we will come back to this, but our session is actually out of time now. I can't ask my panelists to respond, but if we can hear from the last person at the mic, thank you. Hi, I'm Esty. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Manitoba, Treaty One Territory and what's now known as Canada. Um, I would like to talk about uh, efficiency, essentially. So our grant funding uh, timeline is usually around about five years and working in remote communities that perhaps have where the relationship has been destroyed over periods of 200 years that have been forcibly relocated, that have had all kinds of horrible things happen. Um, and we, ex we are expected to create that relationship and maintain it within a five-year grant window because we do not have enough permanent positions to make, maintain long-term relationships with community. And I would really love to see that addressed. Yes, we really agree. Um, and a five-year grant is fantastic. You know, most grants are two or three years. Right. So your point is very well taken. Thank you. Um, we really are out of time. It's after 12.30. I can ask, can you, can our tech team go to the next slide, please? I can't move the slides. Um, what we would really like to do at this stage is just to say thank you to all of you and particularly thank you um, to the panelists and I'd really like to thank the conveners, the team. As Juliana said, this is um, volunteer work. It's not a trivial amount 
of time and brain power and calling on contacts. So I would really like to thank the panelists for their willingness, their openness and their honesty to come up here and talk to all of you. And I'd particularly like to thank the audience for your responses and please yo, reach out. This is an ongoing conversation and this is not the last time you'll be hearing from us. So thank you. <laughs>